Yes, can you hear that? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming. Uh, Justin, thank you for a very lively and forceful presentation. All right, you haven't convinced me yet, but thank you, thank you for that. So, uh, right. Uh, all right, so just to kind of get a sense of things, uh, let me ask, uh, how many of you would consider yourselves committed Christians? Okay. How many of you uh, think that Jesus is God? Okay. How many of you think that Jesus called himself God? Okay. How many of you would like to see me get cream? <laughs> Wait, <good. laughs> Just so that we know what we're up against here. <laughs> okay. Ha. Right. So I've got my work cut out for me. Uh, all right, but the reality is I'm not going to win this debate. Uh, and so we might as well just face that up front. Uh, I'm not going to convince most of you. Uh, I hope I, uh, I I hope I say some things that make some of you think. It's it's more important for me that you think about whatever it is you believe or don't believe. Um, I personally don't care if you are a rabid fundamentalist, a committed evangelical, a, a wide-eyed liberal Christian, or a crazy agnostic. Uh, I don't really care uh, what you are, or if you're Muslim, or Jewish, or Hindu. Buddhist, I really don't care. What I do care is that you think about it. That um, if, if you have a reasoned position for your view, and that you don't simply accept the view that somebody else has fed you, and that you don't simply listen to people because they say things that you agree with, but that you're willing to disagree with what you learn in your home, from your parents, from your teachers, from your preachers, from your Sunday school teachers, that you are willing to disagree because you thought it through and you come to think, you know, I think I was wrong. That is a very painful thing to do. Uh, I myself have done it. I, uh, I applied myself to study at Dallas Theological Seminary back when I was a conservative evangelical Christian. Uh, I'm a graduate of Booty Bible Institute. The Bible is our middle name. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I, I, I come from that world. I come from your world. Uh, I ended up changing my mind. Not because uh, I wanted to be hard-hearted, or because I wanted to oppose God, or because uh, I just, uh, you know, just wanted to be mean-spirited. I changed my mind because I thought I was wrong. And it was emotionally very difficult. But it's what I think is right. So I'm not urging you to follow my path. Follow your own path. The question is, did Jesus, did Jesus consider himself to be divine? Now, I'm, I'm in a real handicap here, handicap here, because it's quite clear that Jesus in the New Testament does declare himself divine. The clearest proof of that is John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus explicitly says, I am divine, you are the branches. <laughs> so I'm really up against it here, because there it is. <laughs> Did Jesus claim to be God? <laughs> right. How much time have I spent already? How much time have I wasted already? Okay, good, thank you. Okay, let me start off by saying what we're not debating, because I think it's very important for us to be on the same page. So what we're not debating, before I get to what I think we are debating, we are not debating the question, is Jesus God? Uh, most of you think that he is God, and I'm not debating that. I'm not saying that Jesus was not God. My, my, I'm an agnostic. I personally don't believe Jesus was, but that's not what we're debating. Okay, just so you can understand. Secondly, we're not asking... Did the writers of the Gospels think Jesus was God? I think the answer is yes. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in different ways, thought that Jesus was God. But that's not what we're debating. We're debating, did Jesus claim to be God? We're also not debating, 
Does Jesus claim to be God in the New Testament? We're not debating that. Because in the New Testament, Jesus does claim to be God. Uh, he doesn't claim to be God in any of the passages that Justin just mentioned. As you may have noticed, if you paid careful attention, Jesus, in none of those passages, does Jesus say, I am God. The first passages he mentioned were from the writings of the Apostle Paul, where Jesus was not speaking. Elsewhere, Jesus talked about being the Son of God. We're asking not that Jesus is the Son of God. We're asking, did Jesus call himself God? He does in some places in the New Testament. Abraham, I'm sorry, John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus says, Before Abraham was, I am. The Jews know perfectly well what he's saying. They took out stones to stone him to death. I am the Father, our one. John 10, 30. Unambiguous. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. John 14, 9. He prays in John chapter 17, Father, glorify me with the glory that I have in your presence before the world existed. He is claiming to have pre-existed with God before the universe came into existence. You will note something about these four quotations, and I could add a couple more. All four of these come from the Gospel of John. Why don't I have any sayings from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, our earliest Gospels? Because Jesus does not make these claims in our earliest Gospels. Why is that? We're not debating whether Jesus claimed to be God in the New Testament. We're asking, did the historical Jesus himself, the man who walked in Galilee and was crucified in Jerusalem, did he, during his lifetime, say that he was God? My view of this is not a weird view of a particularly liberal agnostic who happens to teach in Chapel Hill. It is that. <laughs> but it's not only that. The view that I'm going to set forth now is the view that is the dominant view among New Testament scholars throughout the known universe. That Jesus, the historical Jesus, the man, did not declare himself God. Now the fact that you know, this is the kind of standard view among scholars. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it wrong. But it is the standard view. I just want you to realize this is just not one of my weird things. I, I can come out with a few of my weird things later if you want, but this isn't one of them. This is, this is standard stuff. Jesus does claim to be God in the New Testament, especially in God John. And so, doesn't that prove that Jesus claimed to be God? Well, I'm going, to give a, I'm going to give a more of a direct refutation of what, to what Justin said when I uh, get around to the, to the rebuttals, because I didn't know what he was going to say, and so I, I didn't prepare. For, well, I'm, going to, I'm going to try and say some, some things directly about that. But what I want to point out, just as a preliminary to that, is that Justin did cite several verses from the New Testament where Jesus, for example, claimed to be the Son of God or the Son of Man. But he didn't do what historians do when they approach the New Testament, which is establish that those verses actually were things that the historical Jesus said. If you believe that everything in the Gospels that is recorded on Jesus' lips is exactly what Jesus said, because you believe that God inspired the Bible, and so if the Bible says Jesus said something, then he really said it. If that's what you personally believe, then, then nothing I say is going to change your mind. But that's not how historians go about establishing what the historical Jesus really said and did, and I need to spend the rest of my time explaining why. Why is it there are sayings in the Gospels that Jesus probably did not actually say? That's the issue. If, if Justin disagrees with that, then he's going to have to explain how it is that all of the sayings in the New Testament are 
historically, exactly the things Jesus said. In other words, it, he can't, if we're talking about the historical Jesus, we're not talking about what he personally believes about Jesus. We're not talking about his theology. We're not talking about his religious belief. We're talking about history. How do you establish what somebody in the past actually said on historical grounds? If you can't establish something as Jesus actually having said it, then you don't know whether he said it or not. Let me explain more fully. The Gospels as historical sources. The Gospels are certainly expressions of the faith of the early Christian authors. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were writing down their views of Jesus. They are expressions of faith that are valuable for people of faith today. Of course, the Gospels are where you turn to understand who Jesus was, what he meant, and what he means for you. They are expressions that are valuable for your faith. But that doesn't make them historically accurate. The Gospels is history. Let me talk about how historians go about establishing what really happened in the past. If historians have ancient sources, how do they know if those sources are reliable? This is the same question that we have today. Whenever you read an account in the newspaper, you have to ask, not is it in the newspaper, but is it reliable or not? What do, ancient, what do ancient historians want when it comes to ancient sources? They want sources that are numerous. If you've got stories about Alexander the Great, or about Julius Caesar, or about Caesar Augustus, or about anyone else from the ancient world, or from the Middle Ages, or from the Renaissance, you want numerous sources. You want sources that are close to the time in which the events took place. You want sources that are consistent with one another. You want sources that corroborate one another, that, that say basically the same thing, and yet they say these things without having collaborated with one another. If you're a historian, this is your wish list. Suppose you want to write a biography of Alexander the Great. You want a lot of sources that are near his time, that are basically consistent with one another, that agree on how they present Alexander the Great and what he said and what he did without having borrowed all this information from each other. That's what you want as a historian. You want that for Alexander the Great, you want it for Julius Caesar, and you want it for Jesus. If you're approaching the New Testament as a historian, you have to bracket your personal theological beliefs. You have to, have to approach it the way historians approach sources. In the New Testament, we do have numerous sources. We have four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But these sources are problematic for historians. I'm not saying that they're problematic for believers. I'm not saying you shouldn't base your lives on the teachings of Jesus found in the New Testament. I'm saying if you want to know what Jesus really said and did, these sources are problematic. Let me explain why. If we're looking for those kinds of sources, what do we have in the New Testament? First, the dates of the Gospels. Uh, Justin, uh, sounds like we agree pretty much that the Gospels are written decades after the life of Jesus. I think the Gospels between 70 and 90 uh, AD. Uh, Justin is dating them between 60 and 90. Fine. Uh, Jesus died around, died around the year 30. That means the Gospels were written 30 to 60 years later. They are our earliest sources. The first account of Jesus' words comes to us from a source written 30, 40, 50 years later. Well, who wrote these books? Weren't they eyewitnesses? The authors of the New Testament Gospels do not claim to be eyewitnesses. They don't claim to be people named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are written anonymously. They are not written in Jesus' native language, Aramaic. They're written in another language, Greek. They were not written by lower-class fishermen and other peasants. They were written by highly educated, Greek-speaking people living 40, 50 years later who were living in other parts of the world. Where did they get their information from? They don't tell us. Luke indicates that people have passed on this information from the time there were eyewitnesses, but what are his specific sources? He doesn't tell us. Mark doesn't tell us. Matthew doesn't tell us. John doesn't tell us. 
What scholars have long thought is that these stories have come down to the gospel writers by word of mouth. There weren't gospels floating around a year after Jesus died, or two years later, or five years later, or 20 years later. It was 40 years later. That's when they were first written. Well, where did they get the stories from? From word of mouth. People told stories about Jesus. Jesus died, and people started telling stories about him. One person told another, who told another, who told another, who told another. You know what happens to stories when they get told by word of mouth? Have you ever had stories told about you, told by word of mouth? Are they always historically accurate? Oh yeah, but they wouldn't have changed anything. They wouldn't have changed anything? Why wouldn't they have changed anything? Did they think these stories were going to show up in the Bible someday? They were just telling stories about Jesus. Stories change over time. And they especially change in societies that don't have written records. We sometimes hear that in normal cultures, people preserve traditions accurately. That's absolutely wrong. As any cultural anthropologist who has studied oral cultures will tell you, in oral cultures, stories change all the time because it's important to change the story for your audience and for the needs at hand and for what you think is most important. People are changing the stories year after year, decade after decade, before anybody writes them down. That's one of the reasons there are so many discrepancies in our, in our surviving Gospels. The discrepancies of the Gospels show us that stories have been changed over the years. Let me say something about the discrepancies of our Gospels, and I should just say up front, this is what convinced me that my views about the Bible were wrong when I was, a, when I was in my 20s. When I was diligently studying uh, the uh, New Testament Gospels in the original Greek, I started finding discrepancies. I knew people had said that. I didn't believe it because it was just a bunch of liberals saying these things. So I didn't believe them. But then I started studying. I started realizing there are discrepancies. And once you realize it there, you start finding them. Lots of them. There are important differences among our Gospels that cannot be reconciled with one another. You don't have to take my word for this. Simply read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John next to each other. The problem is when we read the New Testament, we tend to read all of Matthew. We go from the beginning to the end. It's about the life and death of Jesus. It all, okay, it's the Gospel, life and death of Jesus. Then you read Mark, and it sounds like Matthew, life and death of Jesus. Then you go to Luke, it sounds like Matthew and Mark, life and death of Jesus. And you John, that's a little different, but it's basically the life and death of Jesus. And so it all sounds the same, because you're reading them from top to bottom. The way to see that these Gospels are different from each other is not to read them from top to bottom, it's to read them across each other. Read a story in Matthew, then the same story in Mark, and the same story in Luke, and compare them in detail. Do it with the resurrection narratives. Just read for yourself the resurrection narratives and ask yourself, can you reconcile these Gospels? Who goes to the tomb? Okay, some women. Is it one woman or several women? If it's several women, which are their, what are their names? It depends which Gospel you read. What do they see there? Do they see a man there or two men there? Or do they see an angel there? Depends which, which Gospel you read. Was the stone already rolled away from the tomb before they got there or after they got there? Depends which Gospel you read. What are they told to do? Are they supposed to go tell the disciples that they're to meet Jesus in Galilee? Or are they to go tell the disciples that Jesus is going to show up, show up to them uh, where they are in Jerusalem? Depends which gospel you read. Do the women tell anybody? In one gospel, they don't tell anybody. In the others, they go tell. Do the disciples go to Jerusalem, stay in Jerusalem to meet with Jesus? Or do they go to, to Galilee to meet with Jesus? They might say, well, they did all of it. No. Read them carefully. Matthew's Gospel is unambiguous. The disciples immediately go to Galilee, a hundred miles away, and that's where they meet Jesus. Luke is explicit. The disciples never leave Jerusalem for over a month where they see Jesus. It's, it's unambiguous. These are rather important differences. Some of the discrepancies among our Gospels are, uh, are discrepancies written small. What day did Jesus die? Did Jesus die the afternoon before the Jewish Passover was eaten? Or did he live through that day and eat the Passover meal and die the next morning? 
It depends if you want to follow John or Mark. Because they both are explicit when Jesus died, and they disagree. Well, that's a little detail. Who cares which day he died? What matters is he died, right? Yes, if you're a believer, that's what matters. He died. But I'm asking, are the Gospels historically accurate? Sometimes the discrepancies are writ large, such as Jesus' teachings about himself. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus does not go around declaring who he is. What Jesus principally teaches about himself in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is that he has to go to Jerusalem and be rejected by the scribes and elders and be crucified and then raised from the dead. He has to suffer and die and be raised. That's what he teaches about himself. What about the Gospel of John? Whereas Jesus does not say very much at all about himself in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the Gospel of John, virtually all he talks about is who he is. He is the one who has come from heaven. He is the one who has come from God. He is the way to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the light of the world. He is the bread of life. Jesus says, I am all of these things. I am, I am, I am, I am in the Gospel of John. That is, that is incredibly different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What is the payoff for historians? Because our Gospels have so many discrepancies, because they're written 40, 50, 60 years after the events they narrate by people who were not eyewitnesses and probably did not know eyewitnesses, who don't claim to be eyewitnesses, who don't claim to know eyewitnesses, they're written by people living at a different time, in a different country, speaking a different language, who have heard stories about Jesus that have been passed around by word of mouth year after year and decade after decade. Because of that, historians do not think that the Gospels can simply be quoted if you want to know what historically happened in the life of Jesus. It isn't good enough simply to quote verse after verse and say, see, Jesus said that. See, Jesus said that. Did Jesus say that particular thing? Or not? How do you know? Historians have to apply rigorous historical criteria in order to know. Our most reliable sources are usually thought to be our earliest sources. So, for example, the Gospel of Mark. It's not perfectly reliable, but it's 30 years earlier than the Gospel of John. It's probably more reliable than the Gospel of John. But you simply can't take Mark and what Mark has to say, or what Q has to say, or what Matthew has to say, and assume that that's what Jesus actually said. You have to show it on historical grounds. Jesus makes exalted claims for himself in the Gospel of John. There he doesn't simply claim to be the Son of God. He doesn't claim just to be the Son of Man. He claims to be equal with God. He does not make those claims in our earliest Gospels or in the sources of our earliest Gospels. Why is that? If Jesus really called himself God, wouldn't that be widely known? Wouldn't Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Q, and the sources behind Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Q have known about it? If they knew about it, how in the world could they fail to tell us? Matthew, Mark, and Luke want to write stories about what Jesus said, and they neglect to mention that he called himself God? How could they just leave that part out if they knew about it? They probably didn't know about it. They didn't know about it because the historical Jesus did not call himself God. Thank you.